go. This is our second video for Chapter 2, Descriptive Statistics. And today we're going to learn about more graphs and displays. Yay! Okay. So, we're basically going to learn about three types of um, or basically three types of graphs and displays. The first is going to focus on quantitative data. And for quantitative data, we've got two types. We've got stem and leaf, and we've got dot plot. So we're going to learn about stem and leaf plots and dot plots. Those both are used to graph and interpret quantitative data. We're also going to learn how to graph and interpret qualitative data. And here, we're going to use pie charts and Pareto charts. Okay. And lastly, we're going to look at paired data, paired data sets using scatter plots and time series plots. Now, we already looked at scatter plots. We already looked at, we already looked at scatter plots on the first day of class. This was section section 9.1 and 9.2. So it'll be a brief review of scatter plots. Time series charts are just special types of scatter plots. So these are special scatter plots. Scatter plots where one of your variables is time, okay? Pie charts should be familiar to everybody, pie chart that should be pie charts should be familiar. And scatter plots are very close to dot plots. Those are pretty simple. What may be new, stem and leaf, Pareto. Okay. All right. So first let's go ahead and just start off with this example here of stem and leaf. So for our stem and leaf plot, um, a stem and leaf plot, each number is separated into a stem and a leaf. It's similar to a histogram because, however, it still contains the original data value. So we'll see how it's similar to a histogram. In terms of how you can interpret, it's similar to a histogram. But the benefit is that it still contains the original data values. So remember, for a histogram, you lose your original data values because you only keep track of how many data values are in a specific class. With the stem and leaf plot, you're going to actually keep track of your specific data values and you're going to put them into classes. Okay. So let's work with this example right here. So suppose, suppose this is our data. Let me show you how to construct a stem and leaf plot. Okay, so the first thing you want to do is you want to write. So, well, actually, let me see here. So, do you see how we have these numbers right here, which are all 20-something? So, we're going to have 2. The 21, I'm going to write it as, well, let's see here. So, this is going to be my stem. So, I'm going to write 2, 1. This is for 21. For 25, that's like 2, 5. So, I have 2. 5, 25, I got another 5, 26, 6, 27, oh, this is horrible. Let me rewrite it. Let me rewrite it. Okay. So, 21, we'll write as 2, 1, and then we've got two 25s, so I need two 5s over here. 26, I need one six, a seven, and an eight. Now, 30, 36, 36, three. I need to put a zero here. Lots of students will forget to put a zero if it's 30, but you need to put that zero because that holds a place. And then 36, 36, and then lastly, we've got 45. So, you can tell kind of if we were to take this data, and if we were to write a histogram, 
So suppose we had a histogram and suppose our classes were um, 10, or sorry, let's say here, 20, 30, 40, 50. So suppose our classes were 20 to 29, 30 to 39, 40 to 49. Suppose we had three classes, and now our frequency for 20 to 29, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It'd be 6, right? So you can imagine, like here's 6. So we would have this area right here. And then for 30 to 39, 1, 2, 3, we'd have the 3. And then for 40 to 49, we'd have a 1. So this would be our histogram. And if you take, no, I'm going to try to do this. This is going to be kind of, I don't think I can do it. But if, if I could, I would take this and I would rotate it. So if I could rotate it, take this, resize it. No, I want to rotate it. If I could rotate this, let me just try to see if I can do it anyway. What we would get is, imagine rotating it. And now here's six. And here's three, right? And I'm just going to take this and turn this into a bar and turn this into a bar and then turn this last one into a bar. Do you see how there's the connection between the histogram and the stem and leaf? That's why we say that the stem and leaf is similar to a histogram. So, for instance, we can say that half of the data set is less than 30 just by looking here and seeing that this is right because this is this is a lot bigger our total data set is 6 plus 3 plus 1 right 6 3 1 which is 10 and so over half of our data set is less than 20 and those are the same types of common um, comparisons that you can make with the histogram but the benefit is that the stem and leaf plot still contains the original data values, okay? All right, so let's work on a, another example here. The following are numbers of text messages sent last month by cell phone users on one floor of a college dormitory displayed the data in a stem and leaf plot. So now here it can be kind of tricky because we've got 155. So the first thing you want to notice is we're going to write that as 15 five. Okay. So this is actually our key. So let me see. I believe I wrote this on this last page here. Do you see where I put that 25 here? So a key. So always when you have your stem and leaf plot, you want to add a key and your key tells the reader how to interpret. Okay. So We have 25 is equal to 2-5. And here, 155 is going to be 1-5, and then our stem, if you will, 5. Now, if we had data, imagine that we had data like 155.2, 155.3, 155.7, 155 155.4. Then we might have a key that said 155. 2 is equal to 155.2, right? So your key is very important because without the key, I don't know how to interpret the stem and leaf plot. Okay, so that's just an example. Let's see. In fact, let me erase that so we can clean up the clean up here. So here, let me just go ahead and write my key. Display. Oh, I've got a nice little clean sheet here. So I'm going to put key. And I'm going to say. 15-5 is the same thing as 155. Now I'm looking and I'm going to notice that I need to know where to start, right? So if I'm going to have if I'm going to have my stem and leaf plot um, like this, what's my top number and what's my bottom number? Essentially a stem and leaf plot 
is a histogram, is a histogram with extra information. But for this histogram, the classes are have a class width of 10, or a class width of 1, or a class width of 100, right? So that's, that's pretty much the connection. So I'm looking here, and my min, let's see, it looks like my smallest number is 78. So I'm going to start with, up here, I'm going to start with a 7, and I'll have 78. And I can look to see, do I have any other 70s? Nope. Um... In fact, so every time, what about 80s? No 80s, no 90s. It's 1645. I need to put here for my 8, here for my 9. What about 100? Right, 10. Ah, yes. Look what I've got. I've got 109, so I can put a 109. I've got a 109 up. I've got another 109. So I'm looking for 108. What else do we have? I'm, I'm looking for anything that has 10s, 10, 10, 105, 105, okay. Now what's the next one? Next one would be 11. So I'm looking anything that's 11, okay. So that's 6, 4, 2, 2, 8 and 8. Nine three seven eight nine anything with eleven nine two okay and now what about twelve so I've got a nine six two six Right, and you can keep on doing this and you make sure that you exhaust the entire list. So you make sure that every every one of your data entries shows up in your stem and leaf plot. And again, if you turn your head, you can already see us developing a histogram. We're getting an idea of how the data is distributed. Okay, so here we've got the finished product and I would like to draw your attention to the difference between an unordered stem and leaf plot versus an ordered stem and leaf plot. So this first one is unordered because, for example, do you see how we've got a six and a four? Right, whereas over here, everything is lined up in order, in increasing order. So um, if you put all of your data points in increasing order first, you'll end up with an ordered stem and leaf plot. And if you don't, then you'll end up with an unordered stimuli plot. So the stimuli plot I was constructing here is clearly unordered because, look, that's a 9 and then followed by an 8, so that's not in order. Okay. So from the display, you can conclude that more than half of the cellular phone users s sent between 110 and 130 text messages. So let's go ahead and create, where would that show? 110 means we are in here and 130. So 110 to 130, that means we're talking about here. Right, so this is 110. These are the ones with 120 to 129. Right, so more than half. That's This is very believable because there's more there are more numbers in purple than there are outside of the purple okay so again just shift your head to the side and you can see that what you've got is essentially a histogram all right the so next thing is the dot plot dot plots are um dot plots are pretty straightforward so just as a reminder for our quantitative so for our quantitative data sets We've got two types of graphs. One is the stem and leaf. And the second is going to be a dot plot. Okay, So those are going to be our two main ways to graph quantitative data sets. 
And now here's another way. Another way is to just plot each, each one, each data entry is plotted using a point above the horizontal axis. And so notice, for instance, we've got, if you've got two 25s, you just stack them up on top of each other. Okay? And the question is, where does 26 show up? Well, 26 shows up right here, right above the number 26. Okay? Pretty straightforward. So, if we wanted to construct a dot plot, man, these are a lot of numbers. What we're essentially going to do is We've got to figure out. We've got to figure out our min and our max a good, because this will tell us how long we should draw our um, horizontal scale. Okay, so we're looking. We see that our min is seventy-eight, and the max looks like it's about one, maybe one fifty-nine. One fifty-nine. Let's see. Yeah, 159. So it looks like we can just, we just make 75 to 160. And then you just go and plot each point. So above 155, we're going to have one dot. 159, one dot. And you have a whole bunch of dots. Now, we can get a lot of information just looking at this dot plot. For example, we can tell this point right here appears to be an outlier. And we're going to learn what this means. Um, quantitatively <laughs> later on, but this is an unusual data value. So let me just write unusual data value. We can see most of the data points are between 105 and maybe 147, right, or 148. We can also tell instantly that this is the most popular number. Whatever number this is, it just looks like 126. So 126, this tells us just by eyeballing it, that 126 is the, and we'll learn about this later, is the mode, which is the number with the highest frequency. Another way to think about it is it's the most popular number, right? So we can tell 126 is the value that occurs the most. We've got an outlier at 78. And all of this we can tell just by looking at the dot plot. Okay, so now let's move on to qualitative data sets. So we're going to have two graphs, two ways to visualize qualitative data. One is going to be a pie chart. And the second is going to be a Pareto chart. OK. So for a pie chart, this should be very familiar. You've got a circle, and you split it into sectors. And the sectors correspond to, and this, or the sectors are proportional to the frequency of each category. OK. So the easiest way, for instance, well, let's just go through this example, constructing a pie chart. So the number of the numbers of earned degrees conferred in thousands in 2007 are shown in the table. Use the pie chart to organize the data. Okay, so we've got these numbers of thousands. So I'll say, so for instance, how many uh, doctoral degrees? There were 60,000, right? How many uh, first professional, I believe, means like lawyer degree? 90,000. Masters, wow, over half a million, right? Bachelors over a million, right? 1.5 million, and then 728,000 are the associate's degrees. So this is in 2007. Okay, so remember our goal is to do a pie chart. So key here is we're going to find the relative frequency. Remember the relative frequency is going to be a number between 0 and 1, right? Remember, we learned about that in the last section. And the formula for relative frequency is, so relative frequency is equal to, that's equal to F over N, remember? So we need to find N. So let's go back and we need to find N. Now, N is the sum of all of your frequencies. And so in this case, when we add these numbers up, 
So we'll, we need 728 plus 1525 plus 604 plus 90 plus 60. And what do we get? What do we get? So 728 mm -hmm. plus 1525 mm -hmm. plus 604 mm -hmm. plus 90 plus 60. 3007. So let's see. Good. All right. Did a good job. Okay, so for each, we're going to take each of our frequencies and divide it by N. And our N is 3007, and that's going to be our relative frequency. Notice this is a percentage, right? So this is the same thing as 24%. This is the same thing as 51%. So already we can tell for our pie chart, bachelor's degree is going to be a little bit more than half, right? So if that were a good circle... In fact, I can make a better circle with technology, right? Watch this. Okay, not that part. Watch this. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we can tell probably, like, or, you know, maybe a little bit more, like all of this is going to be bachelor's, right? Because bachelor's is about 51%. 20% is master's. 3% is this first professional, and 2% is the doctoral. So 2% is going to be some really small sliver. Now, I'm just eyeballing it now. Do you see how I'm eyeballing it? I'm just going by what I guess. That's not very precise. Here's how we can be more precise. You can be precise by looking at, oh boy, do you remember? Do you remember from geometry? looking at the central angle, right? So you take that percentage, you multiply it by 360 degrees to get the number of degrees, and then you pull out your, what is it? It's like the some little tool that looks like that. I forget what it's called. Is it called a compass, right? And you got your little pencil in there. I don't know if y'all remember. And then you rotate it around and all of that and makes, and then you have to measure the angle and we're not doing it like that. Here's how we'll do it. Well, this is what it ends up looking like, right? This is what it ends up looking like. Here's how we'll do it. We will go to Google Sheets. All right, so we're going to go to Google Sheets. Assuming, do I need to sign in? Please don't. I guess continuous can We'll sign in. So we're going to go to Google Sheets. And I need to make a new one. A new sheet. I'm not used to this app. Plus, maybe plus is to make a new one. New spreadsheet. So this is going to be 2.2 uh, practice. 2.2 practice is what it's going to be called. Create. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in the data. The data, uh, what's the data? The data is, so let's put here associates. I would like to enter in, I need to write. I need a keyboard. Maybe that. How do I get it? Okay. How do I get a keyboard? Oh, here we go. So, associates. Associate, bachelor's. The next one is master. First prof, and then doctoral. Okay. Now, 728. Please hurry up. 1525. 604. 90. And then 60. So this is our information. So what I'm going to do is I need to I want to put in a chart. This is not looking that good. Um, chart. Insert a chart. Oh! This I don't know if you can see this right here. This is 
almost a Pareto. For Pareto, what you would do is you would just rearrange it. So let's say if we can see what type of chart we want. Oh, bam, pi. Pi, there we go. Okay, we're done. Um, now this is an app that I'm using, so I can't really, I'm having a harder time to, like for instance, to go, oh, let's do label. Maybe we can label. Um, bottom, there we go. So now, or I can put the label on the top. So it tells you according to the color, which portion, right? So doctoral is purple and that was 2% or something like that. So that's a legend. Titles, we could give the chart a title. Chart would be um, degrees. It's 17 hours. Degrees conferred. I should be capitalized. Conferred in 2007, and I'm pretty sure this is just the United States. In U.S. Okay, looks pretty good. All right, now, so that is literally the pie chart. Now let's look at what else? Color, colors. We could change the colors around. So that's you know, not a big deal. Okay, so now let's go back to our slides. Okay. Um, you do not have to worry about calculating central angles on any exams, okay? Relative frequency, yes, you should be familiar with that because that allows us to work with percentages and ratios. Okay, but we're not going back to, you know, geometry. All right. Now the second part uh, or the second way that we're going to graph qualitative data is by using a Pareto chart. And remember how I said, so here's what a Pareto chart is. Notice the big difference is you want to have your bars, you need to have some space in between them, right? So Pareto chart versus histogram. Let's write this out. So for a histogram, and this is for a Pareto. So for a Pareto, for a histogram, the bars are touching. The bars are not touching. Bars not touching. For Pareto, this is going to use qualitative. And this is going to use quantitative. And you're going to put the information in classes, right? And this is going to be qualitative. And these are based on your categories or your levels. Okay. So those are the two, the two main differences. And they both involve frequency. So they both have frequency on the vertical axis. So that's how they are similar. And they both are using bar. They're both forms of bar charts. Okay. The last thing is that the bars for Pareto, the bars are positioned in order of decreasing height with the tallest bar positioned at the left. So how do you determine what the what order to put your categories in? Well, the highest bar, excuse me, is on the left. Okay? So let's do this example here. In a recent year, the retail industry lost $36.5 billion in inventory shrinkage. The shrinkage is the loss of inventory through break, breakage, pilferage, shoplifting, and so on. The causes of the inventory shrinkage are administrative error, ooh, employee theft, shoplifting, so employees are stealing more than just people walking in off the street, and vendor fraud, oh yeah, right, that's where you never get caught. Okay, use a Pareto chart to organize this data. We can do this pretty quickly because what are our categories? So down here, our categories, please quit. 
I play The Sims, sorry. Okay, so down here are the categories. What are our categories? We've got error, admin error, employee theft, shoplifting, and vendor fraud, right, which is they bill you for stuff, but they didn't deliver the goods, right? That's the idea. So those are our categories. And then what's the quantity? So now admin is 5.4, employee theft is 15.9, shoplifting is 12.7, and vendor fraud is 1.4. And this is in the billions of dollars, okay? So what is the largest is going to be employee theft. So we can go ahead and make our tallest one here to be this one's going to be employee theft. Right, which is going to be 15.9. And then our next tallest one is going to be like 12.7, which is probably about here, maybe. Or no, maybe about here. 12.7. This is rough. We're doing, it's a rough estimate. 12.7, which is going to be shoplifters. And then 5.4, which is going to be really small compared to that. And then 1.4, which is the vendor. This is admin error. Okay. And so notice for Pareto, what we did was we made sure that you leave a little space in between, right? So make sure you leave a little space, a space in between your bars. Also, that you have, um, that you're putting the, the bars in increasing and decreasing order. So you can see here that we've you make your chart. These are your, over here are your categories, and then you have a column for your frequencies, okay? Oh, unknown, ooh. Ah. How do we get the unknown? I think here's what we need to do. I think we need to add up. So if we add all this up, do we get 36.5? So let's see here, what's 5.4 plus 15.9 plus 12.7? plus 1.4. That is 35.4. Ah, interesting. 35.4 billion. But the total loss is 36.5. So we need to add a little something, right? So there's an unknown, which needs to be 36.5 minus 35.4. Right, so what is 36.5 minus 35.4? 1.1. Sneaky. Good. I like that though. I like that. Here's the unknown. Because imagine you are doing a, um, you know, you're coming in, you're an accountant, and perhaps you're doing forensic accounting, and you need to account for every penny. You need to come and say, hey, what happened to the money? And if they say, oh, well, we figured out we've got 5.4 billion in admin error, 15.9 in employee theft. 12.7 billion in shoplifting is how much we estimate and vendor fraud 1.4 billion but you're still missing 36.5 billion you have 1.1 billion unaccounted for right so you just put that in the category of unknown so that unknown that will go up here unknown it needs to be the 1.1 because remember when you add them all up all of this when you add them all up the sum should be the sum should be 36.5. Okay. So from the graph, it is easy to see that the causes of inventory shrinkage that should be addressed first are employee theft and shoplifting. Yeah, because if you can bring employee theft and shoplifting down, that's going to eliminate a lot of your inventory shrinkage. Okay. So now let's move on. And this is our last topic is uh, paired data. Okay, now I'm going to go through this relatively quickly because we did this in class. Um, scatter plots. Okay, we, we talked about scatter plots with our um, with our linear regression. Now let's just look at this scatter plot here. The question is, as the pedal length increases, what tends to happen to the pedal width? So we're given here that pedal length. Pedal length is our x variable which is our explanatory variable, 
and pedal width is our response variable. So looking at here, now, now each point in the scatter plot represents the pedal length and the pedal width of one flower. Okay, so it looks like as the length of the pedal increases, the width of the pedal increases. So there seems to be a positive correlation, right? Now imagine the length. So what this is saying is that as petals get longer, they also get wider, right? So they're saying that petals are typically like that. It could be that petals just get longer like that. This would be what would it look like? This would be if you had a scatter plot like this. So petal length, as the length gets longer, the width just kind of stays the same. The width stays constant. Do you see? So this would be a scatter plot describing this scenario. This scatter plot is saying that as the lengths of the petals, as the petals get longer, typically, so if you get longer, you're also getting wider. Do you see? So this over here will look more like a description of maybe leaf, leaf length versus leaf width, right? But we know petals typically, especially petals for flowers in general, tend to it's true. The longer the petal is, the wider it is, too. Okay. And remember, we have that. Um, we've got the website. I can't remember what the website was. What is the. Maybe I can find it right quick. The website for Scatterplot. Scatterplot online. Or let's do Scatterplot Maker. Maybe that's it. Yeah, Alcula. This is it. Alcula. Scatter plot generator. Right? Generate a scatter plot. And you enter the XY values. Alcula. That's what we used. Notice that you can also um, create histograms, apparently, with this website. You can create histograms. So, and how do they do it? Are they trying to charge us? I don't know. Let's get out of here. I don't want to pay any money because I can just use Google Sheets. All right. Okay. So the last thing we want to talk about, this is again, our, our last um, graph for paired data. Because for paired data, we're going to have our scatter plot. And now we have a uh, time series. Time series is a special type of scatter plot. Time series just means one of your variables is time. So instead of having, you know how you have your X and your Y, right? X is just going to be time. So either time in years or whatever. Okay, and if you're in this situation, it's called a time series chart. Okay, so let's see. So here's an example. It says the table lists the number of cellular telephone subscribers for the years 1998 through 2008. Construct a time series chart for the number of cellular subscribers. Okay, so this one can be kind of tricky because you have to figure out what is our X and what is our Y. But because it says uh, a time series chart, time series means we need for X to be the year. So our X variable is the year. And then... Um, our Y variable, our response variable, is the number of cellular subscribers, so this is going to be Y. Okay? And it'd be lovely if I could just copy and paste, because we could just copy and paste this data right here onto Alcula. So input to Alcula. That'd be great. That'd be awesome. Um, also, make sure that you practice... Creating scatter plots on your graphing calculator. Okay, because you want to be able to, um, you want to be able to know how to do that before you take the exam and not try to, you know, figure it out on the exam. 
So again, so here we go for the solution. Let the horizontal axis represent the years. And the vertical axis is going to be the number of subscribers in millions. And then you're just going to plot, you're going to just plot the paired data and connect them with line segments. Okay. So this first column here corresponds to our horizontal axis. And then we plot these points right here. So for 1998, we're going to go to 69.2. Right, so that's 69.2, that number right there. And then 86.0 is going to be the next one. You just plot all of these. And lastly, you connect them with a the line. Okay. And the graph shows that the number of subscribers has been increasing since 1998. And actually, this part is... It's 1715. Incorrect. That is false. So it's been increasing basically at a constant rate. So basically at a constant rate. And for those of you who have taken calculus, this is the perfect time for you to check the average rate of change, right? So if you've taken calculus, pull out your old calculus textbook. Remember this formula for the average rate of change. And if you calculate the average rate of change, which is f of b minus f of a over b minus a, you'll see it's pretty much constant for, for each interval, okay? And that's just a side note. That's just a side note. All right. So in summary, we've dealt with and we've come up with how to graph and how to interpret the graphs for quantitative data, qualitative data, and paired data, right? And for quantitative, we've got our stem and leaf and our dot plots for qualitative we use our pie charts and our Pareto charts. And for our paired data, we use scatter plots and time series charts, right? And so the key thing here is that time series has the x equal to time. And you want to connect the dots. For the scatter plot, so the time series is just a special type of scatter plot. For the pie charts and Pareto charts, for pie charts, don't forget to use technology. Okay, and Pareto ch charts are similar to histograms, but um, we pointed out a few of the differences. The bars are um, have to be in decreasing height. That's one difference. The For histogram, you're... Um, looking at quantitative data, whereas for Pareto, you're looking at qualitative data. Um, and lastly, with the stem and leaf plots, stem and leaf plots are similar to histograms, except they contain more information because you still have a record of all of your original values. And dot plots are one-dimensional versions of scatter plots. All right. Have a good day. That's it.